ancient texts described a rather strange object in the sky. Astronomers have just worked out what it was. Scientists for the first time witness a supernova shockwave shooting through a dying star. Our next story telling you all about this. The cosmos stretches, an endless, silent ocean of dark matter and ancient light. For millennia, humanity has gazed upon this void, searching for answers, seeking the moment of creation itself. But up there, among the silent stars, awaits a violence almost beyond comprehension. In a galaxy 22 million light years away, a cosmic giant finally surrendered and we caught it in the act. Using the European Southern Observatory's child-based Very Large Telescope astronomers for the very first time observed the explosive birth of a supernova almost from its opening act. The doomed star, roughly 15 times the mass of our sun, shed its outer shell in a blaze of energy and gas. But the blast wasn't neat and spherical, it bulged out like a vertical olive, distorted by a massive equatorial disk of gas that had surrounded it for years. This glimpse changes the game in astronomy. Cameras at observatories from Hawaii to Chile recorded the explosion's earliest flashes, catching ultra-bright signals on the edge of detection data streamed in real time. In seconds, scientists saw the collapse, the raging heat. A cosmic storm unseen for 13 billion years since the universe was young. Such supernova explosions scatter heavy elements like iron and gold across space. They seed planets and maybe even life itself. Tracking the birth of a supernova unlocks answers to how galaxies evolve, how stars die and the fate that awaits our own sun. Bureau Report, We On, World Is One. It was supposed to be one of the safest places for Syria's ancient treasures. But earlier this week, the National Museum in Damascus became the scene of an art heist that left archaeologists and historians stunned to see the least. Authorities saying at least six marble statues dating back to the Roman era were stolen in a break-in that appears to have been the work of just one or two people. The artifacts were all between 23 and 41 centimeters tall. They were taken from the museum's classical wing, th that section that holds some of Syria's most valuable pieces of history. The museum staff discovered the theft on Monday morning after finding a door broken open from the inside. Investigators believe it wasn't the work of a professional crime network, but possibly an opportunistic job. And they are now questioning the museum staff as the probe gathers pace. The Culture Ministry has released photographs of the missing statues and appealed to the public for help, warning that time is critical before the artifacts vanish into the international black market. Syria's National Museum, founded in 1919, is a cornerstone of the country's identity, home to thousands of relics that trace more than 11,000 years of civilization from the Paleolithic tools, to Byzantine mosaics and Islamic art, the timing of the theft has also raised eyebrows. It comes just weeks after thieves disguised as construction workers pulled off a daring daylight robbery at the Louvre in Paris, stealing priceless French crown jewels. For Syria, the loss feels especially painful. 14 years of conflict have already devastated its cultural heritage 
Every one of its six UNESCO World Heritage Sites has suffered damage. Groups like ISIS destroyed ancient temples that once drew visitors from around the world. New figures from the UK Health Security Agency have revealed a worrying rise in deaths linked to so-called superbugs, which are bacteria that no longer respond to frontline antibiotics. Health experts say this trend highlights the growing threat of antimicrobial resistance. They say that it is one of the world's most serious public health challenges. When antibiotics are overused or misused, bacteria can evolve to survive treatment. Over time, these superbugs become harder and sometimes impossible to treat, leading to longer illnesses and more deaths. The report also found a large increase in private prescriptions for antibiotics in 2024. 22% of all antibiotic prescriptions were dispensed privately, which is more than double the figure from five years earlier. This surge is partly linked to the government's Pharmacy First scheme, which allows pharmacists to prescribe antibiotics for seven common conditions like earache, sore throat, infected insect bites without patients needing to see a general physician. According to the latest data, 2,379 people in England died from antibiotic resistant infections in 2024 and that is a 17% increase on the previous year. At the same time, the number of antibiotic-resistant infections rose sharply to more than 20,000 cases, averaging nearly 400 new cases every week. While the program was designed to ease pressure on doctors, experts are warning that easier access to antibiotics could accelerate resistance if not carefully managed. And in some cases, pharmacies prescribed antibiotics in 45% to 85% of consultations. Depending on the illness, global experts warn that antimicrobial resistance could cause up to 10 million deaths a year by 2050 if current trends continue. Let me just say that again, up to 10 million deaths a year by 2050 if the current trends hold. Although NHS antibiotic use has fallen since 2019, the overall use across both NHS and private care has actually increased by more than 10%, showing that there is still much work to do to curb the unnecessary prescribing. In short, fewer antibiotics are being given out by general physicians, but more are now coming from private and pharmacy channels. And that shift may be fueling the very resistance health officials are fighting to stop. Switching gears for now, in Zanzibar, nearly half the population once lived without electricity. Now, a group of women are changing that. This is the story of Zanzibar's solar mamas, and they are bringing electricity to villages that have lived off the grid for generations. It's a remarkable story. These solar mamas learn to wire, install and repair solar panels, often with little or no formal education. Take the case of Hamna Silima, a mother of eight who once relied on kerosene lamps so her children could study after dark. And today her home glows through the night, powered entirely by the sun. The transformation is being led by Barefoot College International, a school training local women, many of them grandmothers, to become solar engineers. Our focus was bringing light to the rural communities. All the villages which were not yet connected by the grid will select women from there, will give them light. Similarly, Tatu Omari says she knew nothing about tools when she started out and now she installs solar kits that power entire homes. 
When I arrived at the Solar Barefoot College, many things were unfamiliar to me. Now, and for many of these women, their journey is as transformative as the light they bring. Once an unemployed widow mocked for doing a man's job, and today her work is admired and she's inspiring others to join as well. At first, if you tell someone you're going to work, they would ask which job. And if you told them you climb up there, they were astonished and say, that is men's work. How come a woman is doing it? Currently, they understand my value and the fruits of my work. They see it as any other job. Now they want me recommend them as well. In villages where kerosene lamps were once the only light, this is about more than just electricity, of course. It's about health, safety, empowerment. And for many families, solar light means safety and stability. It means children can study through the night without smoke or even fear or any disruption and across Zanzibar. My kids used to sleep with the kerosene lamp. I had to remove it every time they fall asleep. We get strong light that's enough for studying. It lasts all night until morning. More than 1,800 homes have been lit so far. Barefoot College has now expanded its reach training women not just in Zanzibar, but in Malawi, Madagascar, and Senegal as well. Used to seeing women nursing kids, uh, you know, cleaning, you know, cooking, not going on the roof, put a panel, and then the whole house is electrified. So for us, actually, it's, it's not only empowering, but also it's building the sustainable communities. We are now expanding to East Africa and even Central and Southern part of Africa as well for training. Uh, last four years, we trained women from Malawi uh, to, to be solar engineers. Last year, we had uh, nine women from Somaliland. The solar mamas have started a revolution. What started out as a few solar panels on a rooftop has now become a symbol of empowerment, of sustainability, of hope. As they say, the greatest revolutions start out with a simple idea. Let me now ask you this. What comes to your mind when you think of Japan? You perhaps think of sushi, cherry blossoms, sumo wrestling, maybe video games and a lot more. But a very different Japanese trend is exploding online, creating a lot of buzz. Meet the muscle girls. Who are they and how are they challenging beauty norms? Take a look. Japan is a land of contrasts. Futuristic cities. Kawaii culture, and some of the strictest beauty standards in the developed world. But inside one underground bar in Tokyo, that definition of beauty is being rewritten, muscle by muscle. At an underground bar in a busy neighborhood of Tokyo, a dozen women in sportswear stand behind a bar, their chiseled frames on full display, as they dance and crush grapefruits with their bare hands they call themselves Muscle Girls, a fitness-themed bar staffed entirely by women who train hard and are now going viral for challenging Japan's conventional concept of feminine beauty. Since opening in mid-2020, Muscle Girls has been a hit with foreign tourists and domestic patrons alike. It draws about 100 customers a day who pay around $40 for an 80-minute show. The boys at middle school and high school told me, your legs are fat, they said it as an insult, your legs are fat, you don't fit in your skirt. Japan's obsession with being thin has shaped generations of young women. Magazines, influencers, school culture, all feed the idea that beauty equals small, delicate and almost weightless. 
But I think that's something every Japanese girl goes through in her teens. They look at magazines and social media and think, I'm fatter than her, I'm no good. It's a lot. It's like a kind of mind control, a self-imposed mind control. This idea that skinny is beautiful, it's a curse. Just the fact we do weight training already sets us apart from regular Japanese women. It's a community where people who are a little unconventional can gather. I think so, and I think the others think so too. The bar is a place we all cherish. In the heart of Tokyo, the muscle girls are proving that beauty isn't fragile. Sometimes it's powerful, confident, and carved by choice. To stay up to speed with the latest news, download the Weon app and subscribe to our YouTube channel.